This is a diagnostic test harness for the Commodore 64 and 128 line of home computers, and today we're going to build one and put it through its paces. I'm Matt D'Amico, and welcome to episode 29 of Retro Bits. Hey guys, welcome back. In today's bit, we'll be taking a brief look at the history of the Commodore Diagnostic Kit and what it's used for, then building and testing our own reproduction. If you've seen the most recent unboxing episode, you'll recall that this kit was generously donated to the channel by Bill Atkinson, so thanks again to Bill for making this episode possible. As you're undoubtedly aware, Commodore 64s were built to a price point. As a result, many machines needed repair during their original service lifetime. Back in the day, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of authorized repair centers, and one of the tools in their arsenal would have been the Commodore Diagnostic Kit. The Diagnostic Kit included a ROM cartridge with testing software, as well as a physical harness that connected to the machine's I.O. ports. For the manual, the program exercises the 6510 MPU, system RAM, ROM, and internal I.O. circuits of the C64. It goes on to describe each test in detail and provides troubleshooting and repair guidance for each problem the diagnostic may reveal. While I've never seen an original Commodore harness in person before, I'm sure they're out there somewhere. For the rest of us, a reproduction will do just fine, and the one we'll be building today was designed by Sven Peterson. His GitHub has all the info you need to build one yourself, including meticulous documentation. Alternately, you can just pick up a fully built harness from eBay, Amibay, or other enthusiast sites. So here's what we need for today's project. In addition to the parts kit, it's handy to have the schematics available to refer to. I'd like to try and get everything right on the first attempt. Oh yeah, we'll probably need this too. I've long since forgotten how to read resistor code, so I'll sort, test, and label each part in advance. Okay, ready to start assembly. Here's a quick look at the main PCB we'll be building. This module plugs into the Commodore's user port and provides all the breakout connections to the machine's other I.O. ports. Again, this project's documentation is fantastic and contains operational theory and build tips, right down to the individual ribbon cables we'll be making later. And here's the first of what has turned into a comedy of errors with this video. I filmed building the main PCB in a single take. Somehow, between my camera and PC, the file became corrupted and was not salvageable. Since there's no easy way to perform a do-over, you're just going to have to use your imagination. Moving past this setback, here's the first time I've ever soldered an edge connector socket to a PCB. I think the important part is getting the legs bent properly in advance so they sit nice and flush before you start. Maybe I'll even take my own advice next time I do this. Because I didn't bend the bottom legs enough, I had to hold them in place with a screwdriver while I soldered them, so they'd set while making good contact with the board. Lesson learned for next time. Each of these three 4066 chips contains four analog bilateral switches, allowing for cross-connected pathways to be enabled or disabled for each of the I.O. breakouts as needed. And here's the completed user port board. Next up, we'll build the cassette and keyboard dongles.
All right, that's all the PCBs done. Next is the IEC serial port dongle. This is basically just a loopback connector that bridges several pins together, so I'm going to use some of the trimmings left over from the passive components as jumper wires. Now that all the parts are built, we need some cables, and once again the documentation delivers. Essentially, for each ribbon cable, we need to make sure we connect pin 1 to pin 1, and everything else will be gravy. Pin 1 on a female DB9 connector is here, but be careful as it's mirrored on a male connector. Pin 1 is here on the IDC connector, which is keyed so there's no possibility of plugging it in wrong. If we zoom in on the DB9 plug, we see that each pin is actually labeled. It's a similar story for the IDC connector, just look for the embossed arrow pointing to pin 1. Next we need to measure for our ribbon cables. I've chosen to use the 128D, as this model has its I.O. ports the farthest away of any supported machine. If we size our harness for this machine, it'll also work on a bread bin, 64C, or a flat 128. A common problem with the 128D, our tape adapter won't clear the metal housing and will need to be trimmed down. The keyboard connector supplied with this kit only works with the 64. A separate PCB is available for the 128, so I'll order some of those the next time I have other boards made up. Starting with the joystick port, I'll measure, cut, and label this 10-wire ribbon cable. It's standard 2.54 millimeter stuff that's commonly used with IDC connectors. The tape port adapter only needs 6 wires, but I don't have a cable that small, so I'll use this 16-wire part and split it into both a tape and joystick cable. Time to crimp. First, locate pin 1. Insert your ribbon cable in from the top, aligning it with pin 1. Once you perform the crimp, loop the cable 180 degrees and install the strain relief. IDC stands for Insulation Displacement Contact. Basically, little teeth puncture the insulator and make contact with the wire inside, same as when you crimp an ethernet cable. While there are specialized tools for this job, you could probably get away with using a regular set of pliers or channel locks. A bench vise makes short work of the job and applies an even distribution of force. Just be careful not to over tighten and crush the plastic. This is where my second and third screw-ups happened. Initially, I forgot that the 10 wires coming out of the 2x5 IDC end must be reduced for the DB9 end, so I ended up with a bad crimp. I also wasn't paying attention and installed the tape port wire backwards. Once you crimp and install the strain relief, getting the connectors to come apart without breaking the fragile plastic bits is near on impossible. And even if you succeed there, the little teeth inside don't always engage properly a second time. So learn from my mistakes and double check everything against the instructions.
and here's the finished product in all its rainbow colored glory. I didn't know it yet, but two of my ribbon cables were improperly crimped. And of course the keyboard connector won't work on the 128, so this is what it looks like when many of the diagnostic tests fail. For this test, I'm launching the 128 diagnostic software using the 1541 Ultimate 2 Plus. While it's unable to act as a C128 cartridge, it can boot U36 function ROMs, so that's what's going on here. My plan is to build a Versa 64 cart in an upcoming episode that will be able to boot the dead test, C64, and C128 diagnostic cartridges. So I broke out the multimeter and quickly found where I had messed up. With no spare IDC connectors on hand, I was unable to remake the bad cables, but I was able to wire up the tape adapter and install the keyboard dongle on the C64 for a more thorough test. I recently picked up this replacement C64 power supply from Keylog because it's compact, looks great, and appears to be well built. After receiving and testing it out, I did find something I think you should know before buying one. In testing, I found that the power supply is providing 13 volts AC at the 9 volt input when connected to US mains power. Under load, that figure should come down, but that won't happen unless you're actively powering something from the user port, such as certain RS-232 interfaces or EEPROM programmers. Voltage regulators VR1 and VR2 supply 12 and 5 volts DC respectively to the system derived from the rectified 9 volt input. With a high input voltage, these regulators are going to run hotter than designed, which can cause adverse effects, especially on early revision bread bins that have no heat sinks. So anyway, because of that, and because Keylog is aware but hasn't publicly addressed the issue, I can't recommend this product to North American users. Dr. Dave's Diversion has a great video that explains and demonstrates the issue in more detail, so I've left a link to that video below in the description. So the good news is that the PCBs all seem to work as intended. In this test, only one of the joystick ports is hooked up, hence the result. I just need to order a few more connectors and crimp them correctly this time, and I'll have a fully functional diagnostic harness. So there we have it, the Commodore Diagnostic Test Harness, mostly. As a follow-on to this episode, I'll be building the Versa 64 card in the near future, which will hold all the various diagnostic ROM images on a single cartridge, so stay tuned if that sounds like your idea of a good time. I hope you enjoyed this bit, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on RetroBits. <laughs>